All right. That sounds great. I'm excited to be with y'all tonight. Um, this week has been filled with extension for me. I am actually at our state extension conference right now. So I've um, been around a lot of really um, neat opportunities to talk with agents and, and talk about how we translate this information to a producer audience. So again, excited to be here with y'all. Um, so we're going to talk about kind of how we get from a hay sample to the feed bunk. So um, why it's important for us to test our hay, how we interpret that information and take it to an actual ration or a supplement, um, and then put that into, you know, practice on our farms. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about why this is important first uh, to, you know, preface and set us up for why we need to think about this topic. Um, in a cattle operation, we want to make the best use and most efficient use of our forage, whether that's in the form of a grazed forage like pasture or a conserved forage like baleage or hay um, or however we choose to put up that forage. And that's because cattle are specifically designed to utilize forage, right? Their rumen is made to digest fiber um, or ferment fiber and break that down and release those nutrients. And so we need to capitalize on that and really just make good use of the forage that we have. And then if we have a deficiency, whether that's total dry matter or energy or protein, we can address that with supplemental feed. Um, but we really want to try to rely on that forage to meet their needs first. And so when we talk about hay testing, the reason that that's important is because we want to start with exactly what we have. We want to know what the nutrient content of our hay is um, before we start to balance a ration. That will help us to make um, a more economical choice when it comes to supplementation, but also to match the forage that we have to the cow's needs at that time. Um, so we're going to go through these concepts a little bit more in depth. But first I wanna think about forage quality and kind of the definition of that, but really some of the different factors that influence um, forage quality. So a lot of times we get caught up on the TDN value or the crude protein value if we have a hay analysis, but really I like you to step back and think about first, is it something that they'll eat? Is it palatable? Uh, and I would say for the most part that our hay is palatable for cattle. Now, if it's really low quality or uh, if it has um, a lot of weeds in it or, or something that has spines or, or briars on it, that might be something that they're less likely to consume. Um, and so if we think about whether or not they'll eat it, if they won't eat it, then whatever the value of that hay is doesn't really matter because they haven't actually consumed it, right? And then we have to think about intake um, and think about this in terms of is their intake limited? So how much can they actually physically get into their rumen uh, and have it broken down by those rumen microbes and pass through? And so if they are consuming a lower quality hay that has a good bit of fiber in it, that fiber creates a filling effect and that rumen fill slows down their rate of passage. It slows down the breakdown of that forage and takes them a little bit longer um, to get it through. And so because of that, their intake can become limited if that forage tends to be, or if it has a, a higher concentration of fiber. And then once we think about it being in the rumen, how much is actually digested? Um, this relates to fiber as well. It just relates to a different type of fiber that's in the plant. Um, but really how can those rumen microbes, how well can they digest or break down that forage? And then once we kind of get through those stages, what are the actual values? What is the concentration of protein? What is the concentration of energy in that forage? And so maybe this doesn't happen in these actual steps, but all of these things influence forage quality. And at the end of the day, that animal performance is based on what that quality is. And so, you know, if we take a step back and say, if they don't eat it, the rest of these things don't really matter, right? So we have to think of a more kind of a holistic picture of that forage quality. So every bite counts and we wanna make sure that again, it's economical and it matches what our cattle need. Now, when we think about how we appraise hay, you know, typically we would want a forage test 
Um, but we can use visual appraisal to make some relative, um, to make, you know, get some relative uh, idea about how good that hay quality is. Uh, so if we look at these three pictures here, we could say that the hay on the left is, you know, lighter in color. It looks like it doesn't have um, as much hay that's going to be peeled off or wasted. Maybe it looks like from here it's finer stemmed. It's a little bit hard to tell from this picture, but we can only say that relative to the other two bales. So we can say, you know, this one looks good or this one looks bad or that one's just ugly. And we can say that compared to one another, but I can't compare one of these bales necessarily to a bale that is out in the field that I haven't looked at or tested. So we can do some visual appraisal uh, looking at these indicators. So indicators of quality, um, if we're thinking about where the good stuff is in a forage plant, it's typically in the leaves. And so we want that hay that's been put up to be very leafy. We want a lot of leaves relative to the amount of stems that are in there. Um, and if we get that, that means that that plant is not very mature. Now, as that plant becomes more mature, that's when the stem ratio starts to go up and we get less leaves on that plant or in that hay. We also might use odor um, as a, an indicator and that can be things like musty or moldy odors or if it's very dusty, something that's going to be off-putting to that animal to keep it from consuming the hay. Color, uh, a lot of folks rely on color to be an indicator of quality um, and I'll say that it can be pretty deceiving. So green hay is really pretty. It looks nice, right? But um, it doesn't always tell us what the quality is. When we think about softness, that relates to that leafiness. So you can imagine if something is more leaves, um, it's going to be softer than if it were stems, which tend to be more fibrous. Purity is one that we think about, especially when we're being marketed um, a certain type of hay. So if we're buying mixed grass hay, then you know we understand that it's probably going to be some mix of whatever was in the hay field at that time. But if we're being marketed or, or we're purchasing um, Bermuda grass hay or fescue hay, then we wanna be confident that that bale is mostly whatever species it's being marketed as. Um, so making sure that it's pure in that species if that's how it's being sold. Bale condition, so those pictures on the last slide were pretty good um, representations of bale condition. Uh, if we go back and look at those, you can see the one on the left, again, is in much better condition than maybe the ones in the middle or on the, the right. And then finally, contaminants. So are there things that are going to cause harm to our animals? Are there toxic weeds? Um, are there plants that may have nitrates, which maybe is not necessarily a contaminant, but something sort of additional that we need to think about um, that could contribute to some issues if our animals eat it. So we've talked about that visual appraisal, but really I want to talk more about forage testing, um, why it's important, how we do it, and how we use those results. So taking that forage sample uh, having it analyzed by a lab is the only way that we can truly know the nutritive value of that hay or of that sample. So you've probably heard someone say, if you don't test, it's just a guess. And when it comes to feeding our animals, not only do we want to know what we're feeding them just because it's the, the right thing to do, right, to deliver the amount of nutrients that they need, but also economically, we want to try to get a ration or a, a supplement program that is as economical as possible. And if we're just guessing, if we're uh, not taking a forage test, then we're gonna have to guess either on the high side or on the low side. And that can really eat into our budget depending on you know, what our input cost looks like. So I use this example to drive home this point of why we shouldn't guess our forage quality. Um, this is from the UGA Master Cattle Producer Program. We have a similar program in Tennessee, and I think you all do in Kentucky as well. And so during this program at, at UGA, uh, they asked producers to bring in a hay sample. And when they turned in that hay sample, they had them guess the crude protein and guess the energy content or the TDN. 
And then they analyzed that forage and they compared those results back to what the producers guessed. And so they found that 83% of producers underestimated crude protein and 50% overestimated TDN. So basically they didn't think they had enough protein uh, and a, a majority of them or close to a majority thought they had enough energy. So how does that pencil out? How do we relate that to our actual production setting? If we have an estimated value of 60% TDN, and we don't actually have this test, but kind of over here on this side example, we understand that our actual value was 55 and a half. So we know, or we think our estimation is 60% TDN. If we had it analyzed, it would be 55.5. So there's a, a difference of four and a half percent there. But we're operating under the assumption or the estimation that our TDN is 60%. And understanding cow nutrient needs, we decide that 60% is enough. So we're not going to feed our cows any additional supplement on top of that hay. And what happens is we're not actually meeting their needs. So these, these cows lose condition. And that takes them longer to breed back. So they fall outside of our, our um, calving window or breeding window, and it takes them longer um, to get pregnant. Now they finally do get pregnant. It just takes them a little bit longer. And they have a calf and, you know, we get through to weaning time. And when they wean that calf, because it took them a longer time to get pregnant, that calf is going to be lighter at weaning than it would have been if the dam had gotten pregnant earlier. So our calf is 80 pounds lighter than either the other calves in the group or what we would expect at that weaning weight. So if we go take this calf um, to the market and we get $1.50 a pound, then that's $120 per calf for that 80 pounds that we're not getting or we're not realizing uh, due to the fact that our cow didn't get pregnant early enough and that calf is lighter weight. Now, if we had known what the value of this hay is, if we had tested the hay and we had purchased a supplement, something like corn gluten feed uh, for 190 a ton and fed four pounds of that per day per cow for a 60 day period, which is just kind of during that time uh, of peak lactation, making sure that she doesn't drop condition, then our investment here in our feed is $23. We have an investment in the hay test, of course, which here in Tennessee is $17. It's probably not much different there in Kentucky. And so that $23 investment could return us that $120 on that calf in theory because the calf would have been born earlier uh, because the cow bred at the right time. And so when you think about you know, a, a difference of four and a half percent doesn't sound like a lot, but when we translate that into our production numbers, and especially if it's more than one cow, um, then that starts to add up pretty quick. So the return on investment of a hay test in particular, and maybe even a, a little bit of feed can be pretty good when we think about it in terms of what is our actual value of our product that we're selling. So how do we ensure that that quality, that hay is the quality that we need? Um, so if we take a step back and think about how forages grow, the physiology of, of the way that a plant changes from the time that it emerges or comes out of dormancy up until it reaches bloom stage, uh, this figure shows us that in their leafy growth stage, so as they start to come out of dormancy or emerge, they're, they're very leafy, they're very high quality. So we see up here, the protein percentage is high. The percentage of leaves, especially compared to stems is high uh, and mineral content is relatively high. Now, as we move to the right across this figure and we go to the bloom stage over here on the far right, we see that that plant has put on uh, a lot of stem material. So less leaves compared with stems. It's put on a seed head. And during that process, from the time that it got from its leafy growth stage to its bloom stage, uh, it accrued a lot more fiber. And so we see an inverse of quality and yield. So high yield, but that also means high fiber, a lot of stems and lower amounts of protein and lower 
uh, numbers of leaves compared to stems. And so what we want to do if we're making hay is ideally we want to target that kind of boot stage, which is right before the seed head emerges. And that's where we can optimize the quality and the quantity of the hay that we're producing. Now, if we're purchasing hay, it's a little bit harder. Um, but, you know, if, if we understand this concept of the trade-off between quality and yield, and then understand that we need to test that forage, um, then that's going to help to inform our decisions when we make a, a supplementation plan. So this is a similar figure. Uh, again, we have yield increasing as that plant moves through its growth stages. But if you think back to that forage quality slide that I mentioned or that I, I showed you, it had intake and digestibility as uh, factors that influence quality. And so as that yield increases, we see a decrease in digestibility and that decrease in intake, meaning slower uh, breakdown and so a slower passage rate through the rumen. And so that limits the amount of forage that that animal can take in. Typically, we want to see between 2 and 3% as a pretty general rule of thumb for intake of their body weight. and as that digestibility increases, or excuse me, as that digestibility decreases, um, we see that intake decrease uh, as a percentage of their body weight. So they're gonna eat more like one and a half to 2% of their body weight in dry matter rather than closer to 3%. Um, and so we see that shift as we let forage get more mature. So if you want to see a good picture of boot stage, I actually think I borrowed this from Chris Toich there at Kentucky. Um, so shout out to him <laughs> for, for this picture. But uh, this is a really good representation of that seed head right before it comes out of the leaf um, and emerges into full bloom. And so that's what we're looking for at the place that's going to optimize that quality and quantity. And just to drive home that point of why this stage of maturity is so critical, um, this was a, a study that was done um, that compared basically stage of harvest. So essentially, if we simplify this, if we look at this column on the left, stage of harvest, uh, and we think about this in terms of the first cutting of hay, they took the first cutting from one field on May 3rd, so pretty early for a hay cutting. They took the first cutting on May 14th from another field. And then another field, they took the first cutting on May 25th. So they waited a longer time to harvest the first cutting of hay. And what we see as a result of that is overall, um, as that stage of maturity increased, the quality decreased. So plant digestibility went down, protein went down. And if we think about animal performance, that pounds of gain per day or average daily gain also went down. Uh, now, we do see that trade-off of yield here. So that first cutting of hay that was early yielded a lot less, so about 1,500 pounds per acre less than this late cutting. But, you know, we had to feed a lot more hay and we got a lot lower animal performance in this situation. Um, and so if we look at the optimal point, we could just say that this kind of mid quality hay is the optimal point. We're looking at about a pound of gain per day um, and 1800 pounds of hay per acre. Then think about that as that place where yield and quality are sort of optimized. They're kind of in the middle um, and good on either side. So we're trying to optimize both that quality and yield and understanding that if we wait later to cut hay, then we're going to have a trade-off uh, of that quality. Now I say all that, um, understanding that, you know, weather can be a huge factor um, in when we can get our hay put up. And so these are obviously ideal conditions that we're shooting for. And then once we have that hay put up, if it was put up in less than ideal conditions, that's why we hay test and base our supplement on that. So as long as we can make an informed decision, even if we didn't get our hay up at an ideal time, at least we know what we have and we can supplement based on that. 
So how do you take a hay sample? Pretty easy. Um, you just need a, a hay probe with a plunger, which is in the picture there. And I'm, I'm sure that agents around your state have access to those or have them in their offices um, and probably have a drill that you can use as well. And so you just take that hay probe, you put it, um, attach it to a drill, you go out to your, your hay barn or, or wherever you keep your hay put up, um, you take a bucket with you and you take several core samples and you mix those samples together to get a representative sample of the whole lot of hay. Um, just as a note, if you're sampling uh, wet hay or baleage and you have to puncture that wrap, make sure that you take tape and close that up as best you can. Um, it does create a little bit of a challenge when we have to open up that plastic. So sometimes it's best to test that baleage right before you feed it out because one, it's gone through its fermentation process, but two, um, we can reduce the amount of air that gets into that puncture just by feeding it out once it's been opened. So like I mentioned, you wanna get a, a representative sample of each lot of hay. If you have a round bale, you wanna go into the side. So onto that round side, you wanna go perpendicular to that side, uh, straight toward the core or, or the middle of that bale. And you wanna cord you know, 12 to 15 inches deep. You wanna get all the way through there so that you can get a represent, representative sample of the whole bale. And then you wanna take you know, 10%, ideally a few more um, samples. I've got 15 to 20 there. I think the recommendation is, is 10 a lot of times. But basically, the more hay bales you have, the more samples you need to take to make sure you're getting a representation of all of the hay in that cutting. Uh, and so you'll mix all of those cores together. If you take 15 core samples, you'll mix them together in a bucket. You'll um, label them. You'll send them for analysis and then you'll get your results back. Now, just as an aside, if anybody's interested in how some of these samples are analyzed, I'm not sure what you have as far as analysis there in Kentucky, but um, in Tennessee, our samples are all analyzed by NIR uh, or NIRS. And so basically they use near infrared wavelengths to shine through that forage sample once it's been ground. And those wavelengths reflect organic nutrients in that plant. And basically that can be calculated to tell us uh, the amount of TDN or the amount of protein in that, that forage. It does require calibrated equations, but it's faster than wet chemistry. Um, so just a, a technology that's being used to analyze a lot of forage samples now. And probably what's being used in, in most labs that um, are testing forage pretty quickly. And these are backed up by wet chemistry standards. So that's just kind of a, maybe not something that you need to know uh, on, your, on a daily basis, but something that I find interesting. And I think that, you know, people would like to hear about more since they're sending their forage to be tested. So once it's been analyzed, you'll get a, an analysis back. And this is one that comes out of a Tennessee lab, but it's got the same components that would come out of a Kentucky lab or Kind of anywhere else across the U.S. and um, it's broken down into different parts but kind of the main places that I look are the dry matter versus as fed basis. So you'll notice that here in the top of this particular um, analysis sheet there is a dry matter percentage and a moisture percentage and that helps me when I go to balance a ration to make sure that I'm correcting everything on a dry matter basis so I'm comparing it apples to apples, making sure that everything is set at the same um, dry matter level. And then I can correct it back to as fed to make sure I actually feed enough of that forage or feed stuff. Uh, so make sure that you understand that most of our data is presented on a dry matter basis, but when we go to feed it out, we'll need to correct for that moisture content. Uh, there's also energy values. So I've got, um, several different ways that that's reported here, TDN or net energy. Uh, these are just two ways that we can report and measure um, energy in a forage. Typically when I balance a ration, I do focus on TDN. Um, and the, you know, it just kind of depends on what your goals are. Um, when I think about growing cattle, sometimes I'll tend to use net energy because it, it accounts for maintenance and for gain. Um, but when I'm balancing rations for brood cows, I typically use TDN. 
And that just sort of depends on the nutritionist that you're working with. Uh, in Tennessee, our report does have a basic mineral component that's already included with the test that we get. So thinking about those big minerals, um, really important ones in the diet, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and potassium. And then you'll notice that we have some blanks here. Uh, if you want to get an expanded mineral pack or analysis, um, you would pay an additional cost to do that. And then carbohydrates. So basically thinking about all of the fiber and the sugar in that plant um, and the majority of what makes up that quality, right? So there's a couple of different components that I look at. Um, I'll look at acid detergent fiber, which is related to um, digestibility. I'll look at neutral detergent fiber, which is related to intake. And I'll sometimes look at lignin. Lignin is important because it's completely indigestible. And if we see that lignin number go up, that tells us that that lignin is tying up nutrients because um, it, it causes those nutrients not to be able to be released. So in a very mature hay, uh, we would see that lignin percentage be higher um, than in a, a hay that was cut earlier. So I thought I had this slide in here, but I wasn't sure. That's why I went ahead and started talking about it. But um, I do, in fact, have the fiber fractions broken down here. So NDF, like I mentioned, that's neutral detergent fiber. Um, and it's inversely related to intake. So what that means is as the NDF concentration increases, the animal's ability to take in that forage decreases. And so there's a, a kind of a rough estimation of this equation here, 120 over the NDF percentage is roughly about the dry matter intake that that animal um, can consume. And so, like I mentioned earlier, we're looking for 2% roughly for a brood cow. And so that means that we're looking for about a 60% NDF concentration. If we do that 120 divided by 60, that means our, our cow can eat about 2% of her body weight. So I use that 60% NDF as a kind of an index or a guide of, okay, if it's above 60, it's uh, they're going to be able to eat less. If it's below 60, they're going to be able to eat a little bit more. And then ADF, acid detergent fiber, is related to digestibility. So similar to NDF, um, as that ADF increases, digestibility decreases. And then, like I mentioned, that lignin is 100% indigestible and it starts to tie up the nutrients that are in the plant. All right, so I've mentioned this two to two and a half percent number for our mature cows, but just uh, as a reminder, you know, as those different classes of animal have different requirements, so stalker calves are growing faster, they're gonna be able to consume more, um, and hopefully they're eating higher quality hay than our mature cows are. And so we're looking at two and a half to 3% of body weight for those stalker calves. And then if we relate that to a lactating dairy cow, she can eat, you know, three to 4% of her body weight. So um, that amount that she's consuming is relative to her body weight and kind of relative to her, uh, to their growth rate or their stage of production. So how does that translate to what we actually feed to cows. Um, if we do an example here of a mixed grass hay, we take that dry matter percentage that we have on the forage analysis and understand that it's 85%. We've got a dry pregnant cow who's 1,200 pounds and we have her eating two and a half percent of her body weight per day. So that's here, 1,200 times two and a half percent is 30 pounds and that's in a dry matter basis. So she's gonna eat 30 pounds of dry matter per day. Now our hay is only 85% dry matter. So we have to go back and correct for that. And we've done that here on the bottom line, 30 divided by that 85% means that we need to feed her 36 pounds per day. And so maybe we don't go out and feed individual cows 36 pounds, but this type of, of math helps us to kind of figure out and expand, you know, how many cows do I have how much are they gonna eat per day? How much hay do I have? And then we can start to use those numbers in that inventory to figure out if our hay is gonna carry us through the winter, if we need to, to purchase more um, and sort of what our, our inventory looks like throughout those months. 
And then, like I mentioned, as that hay quality decreases, so as we have a lower hay quality, which is the top lines here, dry matter capacity is lower. So more mature hay or lower quality hay means cows can eat less of it. And so that will influence, uh, again, thinking about your hay inventory, how much those cows will consume and how much they actually need to probably consume um, to get through on a day-to-day -day basis. If we think about some pretty basic energy and protein requirements, so this is just very general crude protein and TDN values for different stages of production. Uh, so we've got our brood cows here, our mature cows, and when they're dry and pregnant, so they're at their lowest energy need, um, then their TDN requirement is about 48% in their diet, and their crude protein is 7%. And then if we see them move through their kind of their calving cycle, so they enter into peak lactation, and that need or uh, yeah, that need goes up to meet that lactation requirement, and then they wean off that calf. Uh, in late lactation, and that requirement goes down again. So that's for our mature cows, our brood cows. You'll notice that I've got lactating heifers here separately, uh, and that's because our heifers, when they have their first calf, have not reached their mature body weight. So not only do they have a maintenance requirement, they also have a lactation requirement, and they're continuing to grow on top of that. Uh, so they have an even higher energy and protein need than our peak lactation cows. And if we know that we have a lower quality hay and a higher quality hay, and we can manage those two groups separately that, you know, to match their requirements more closely, um, then that's how we can make, again, that efficient use of hay being more strategic and precise in the way that we deliver those nutrients. So I'm a visual person. I like to put things onto figures and, and charts and things like that. So I took those kind of the same numbers or similar numbers and put them in a chart here. And we can see that one month prior to calving, so dry pregnant cow um, is, you know, down here on the lower end of these needs as far as energy and protein concentration. When she enters into this peak lactation, which is the second bar here, her needs go up. And then we see that continue um, back down as she weans off that calf and goes back into the dry pregnant phase. And so ideally, because we want our cows to have a calf every year, we see this cycle continue and we can anticipate when their needs are going to be high and when they're going to be low. And then we can match the forage quality that we have to what our animals need at a given time. So we're going to walk through a scenario where we compare three different forages, basically looking at, we're going to focus on energy in this example, um, looking at what we're going to consider a low, moderate, and a high quality forage. So A is our low, B is our moderate, and C is our high. Now, if you look at the quality, uh, specifically if you look at the TDN, 50% for our low quality and 70% for our high quality, those are not representative of what we see most cow hay um, being in terms of, of TDN. So a lot of our cow hay is, is certainly not going to be 70%, and sometimes it's not even going to be 50%. But you'll notice as we walk through the scenario, I just want you to think of them relative to one another. How does low quality hay match their requirements versus how does high quality hay match their requirements? So again, the first thing we have to think about is can they eat enough? Can they actually get it into their rumen? So one of the values that was on that chart previously was net energy for maintenance. This is uh, similar to that NDF uh, percentage, meaning it's an indicator of intake. So as net energy for maintenance decreases, the amount of net energy for maintenance in that forage decreases, then that cow can eat less of that hay. That's because it has higher fiber components and therefore it has less net energy for maintenance available in it. Uh, so we see that in the figure here. Um, as that energy value goes down, then the amount of forage that animal can eat voluntarily will go down. So if we take our three forage, uh, three forages that we had, the forage A, B, and C, 
our low quality forage falls about here. And if we match that up to dry matter intake, we see that they're consuming only about one and a half percent of their body weight. And then they're gonna start to be limited uh, on their intake based on that rumen fill that they get from the fibrous um, plant. Forage B in this example, we move up further closer to that 2% of body weight. And forage C in this example is kind of off of our chart, but that just tells us, okay, I don't have to worry so much about voluntary intake because this forage is high quality enough that that's not going to be a limiting factor. And then, like I mentioned, so I brought up those replacement heifers earlier to make this point, but nutrients are used uh, by priority. So when nutrients enter the body, they're used for maintenance first, and then they're used for lactation, or they're kind of used together um, on that level. And then they can be used for growth, then pregnancy, um, and then establishment of a new pregnancy. And so a forage only has a certain amount of energy in it. And if all of that energy goes to maintenance, or if there's not even enough to meet maintenance, then we're certainly not going to meet lactation or growth, growth requirements. Um, so specifically in the case of those first calf heifers, if we're barely meeting maintenance requirements, then she's not going to lactate very well. She's not going to grow. And she's certainly not going to cycle in and come back into heat and rebreed. Um, so we have to think about these kind of nutrient partitions and understand that they've got to meet several different requirements on their body to, to get through to this next um, time that they breed. And we have to think about the fact that um, when we're, we see a lactating cow and she loses body condition, that's not necessarily a negative. I mean, we, you know, ideally she's going to maintain her body condition but if she goes into the calving season with a higher body condition, so uh, like a six, for example, and she goes through lact lactation and she drops some body condition, she's probably still in a condition where she can breed back pretty quickly because she has enough energy stores in her body and she's consuming uh, enough energy in theory to, to be able to breed back or come back into heat. Um, and so we want to just give those cows a little bit of room or those heifers a little bit of room when they go into the calving season to be able to drop some body condition because we know that that lactation is going to pull uh, some of that energy. And then even if she has drop condition, you know, she can breed back in a timely fashion. Um, but if she goes into the calving season at a low body condition, then she doesn't have a lot to lose, right? She, she can't afford to lose a lot of body condition, I should say. Um, and that's because of this nutrient partitioning. It's taking all of the energy that it can, which is probably limited in a low quality hay, and putting it towards just maintenance, and it's not able to meet these other needs. All right, so the reason that I, I brought those partitions up is when we look at these charts on the next couple of slides, you'll see several bars uh, here indicating those different partitions. So the blue bars are the maintenance requirement, the orange bars are the growth requirement, then we see lactation, pregnancy, and this line I want you to focus on here, this blue line, is the total. So if we took those bars and stacked them on top of each other, then we would see that they equal that total amount of energy. But just understanding that it's used in different ways, uh, one month after calving versus 10 months after calving. So there's just a different partitioning of the way that that energy is used. So this is her energy needs, and we see that it follows that cycle. Uh, after calving, she moves into peak lactation. Then we move into late lactation. We wean her calf, and then she you know, is pregnant and growing that pregnancy up until she calves again. So we see this cycle of her energy needs, and we see the same thing with protein. So I'm going to mostly focus on energy in this example, but protein is going to follow the same pattern. Now, if we actually look at how those forages A, B, and C meet these needs, you'll notice that that blue line has flipped kind of over. So we see the cycle still, right? We see one month after calving. We see this would be peak lactation two months after calving. 
up here would be weaning about seven months after calving. And then we move into that dry pregnant phase. And so I, you can still see the cycle here, but it's flipped upside down. And that's because we're looking at it in terms of energy status. So how much energy she actually has available to her. And, it, and we want it to be in that equilibrium or that zero where she doesn't have too much and she doesn't have um, not enough or she's not in a deficiency. We want to, to see that, you know, spot on. We know that's not the case. Um, so in this low quality hay, so remember our forage A, our 50% TDN hay is low quality in this example. And like I mentioned, that, that nutrition goes right hand in hand with her reproduction and how well she breeds back. And so if we're trying to keep her on that yearly calving cycle, we want her to have a calf once a year, then she needs to breed back within about 60 days of calving. And that body condition or that energy store that she has, that amount of fat that she has on her body, um, will be an indicator of how long her postpartum interval is. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, if she goes into the calving season too low here with a body condition score of three, her postpartum interval is close to 90 days. And that puts her out of our breeding season, out of our calving season. And if you think back to that example, close to the beginning of the presentation, if, if our calves are out of season and they're lighter when we sell them, then we've lost some return that we could have gotten if those calves had been born on time. Uh, and so if we have them going into the calving season at a higher body condition, so six or seven, that postpartum interval is more appropriate. It's closer to that 60 that we're looking for. And then just to drive home that point, uh, this table shows a, a range of body condition scores and the pregnancy rates and resulting calf performance from cows in those body conditions. So just as a, a general summary, low body condition, it takes her longer to breed back, her calves don't perform as well, and we're not getting uh, a very good return on the number of cows that are exposed to uh, either a bull or to AI. So we wanna try to maintain those cows up here in a six, round of six body condition so that we can ensure they breed back and have a calf once a year. All right, so let's put some of this together. Knowing your hay inventory. So like I said, we wanna to test our lots of hay. We wanna test them individually. So every cutting that we have, we wanna test it individually to get a representative sample of each of those. We wanna store it properly and we want to match it to our cows. So once we've, you know, we've gone through these nutrient needs, we know what they are. If we take these three hay cuttings in this example, this is our early hay cutting, number one, kind of our middle and our late. And if we just do a first in, first out approach, if we didn't test them and we just said, okay, we're just going to go grab the first thing that we put in the barn. What happens is we end up feeding our hay, um, at the wrong time. So I, I skipped ahead a little early, but if we do a first in first out, we take this first cutting, this high quality here, and we feed it to our dry cows, especially if we're in a spring calving season. So then, okay, we've run out of this first cutting or high quality hay, we get to our next hay and we feed it to our cows and they're now in late gestation. And then we get into the spring and all we have left is this hay which happens to be our lowest quality, but now our cows are in early lactation. So we've kind of swapped what they need and what we have. Um, and if, so if you think about that deficiency level, if we put low quality hay in a, a cow that has very high needs, our supplementation rate is gonna be a lot higher. But if we can match it, if we know that inventory, we know the quality of each cutting, then we can say, I'm gonna put my low quality hay on my dry cows then I'm going to go to my moderate quality. Then I'm going to take my highest quality hay and, and wait and feed it when they're in early lactation. And that helps me to reduce the amount of supplementation I actually have to provide. 
So if a producer calls me or an agent calls me with a question uh, about supplementation and they say, do I need to supplement my cows this winter? Uh, the first thing that I ask, you know, people might think, well, it, it depends on the stage of production or it depends on what type of hay you have. But the first question I say is, do they have a hay test? And then I can work on, you know, using those numbers to make a more informed decision. Then I'll follow up with, okay, let me know more about your scenario. What class of livestock is it? What's their body weight? What's their stage of production? All of these things are important for the reasons we've talked about so that we can match what we have to what our cows actually need. Um, so do you have a hay test? And then what is the feeding scenario essentially? And we can take those numbers. I'm just gonna to move through this slide pretty quick, but we can take those numbers and compare them to something. So if we just have hay that looks good, we don't have any numbers associated with it, then I can't compare them to what my cows need. But if I have a forage analysis, then I can say for sure, yes or no, I need to supplement. All right, so energy uh, tends to be most limiting in our forages here in the Southeast, especially. And if we think about winter feeding, um, when it gets really cold, then winter can be an issue compounded by the weather. Um, and so if we feed protein and we focus on protein, we're not actually solving the energy deficiency. So it's really important that we know what the quality of our hay is so that we can feed the right nutrient. And often we think about protein because that's what's on the label, right? You might go to your feed store and buy a 12% pelleted feed. Well, that's 12% protein. And so that's on the forefront of your mind. But we want to make sure that we're meeting and matching the deficiency that we have. So if it's an energy deficiency and we feed protein, we're not solving the problem. We're just spending a lot of money on protein. Um, so we want to know what that deficiency is and strategically fix that problem rather than just trying to, to fix it by feeding additional protein. So when it comes to types of feeds, what we actually can use to meet these deficiencies, uh, we can look at energy feeds, protein feeds, and those that, that have a little bit of both. So our energy feeds are going to be, obviously corn is kind of the standard, um, but doesn't really match as well in a, a forage-based diet. Um, but things like soybean hulls, whole cottonseed, distillers, and corn gluten can provide a good bit of energy. But you'll notice that on that protein side, distillers, corn gluten can also provide protein. Some of those oil seed meals can provide a good bit of protein. And then mixtures of these types of feeds can provide both. So they're a more balanced profile of that energy and protein that's needed. If you're looking at a commercial feed that's just a mixed feed that you buy at your local feed store, um, you're you know, probably going to want a high energy feed if you have an energy deficiency. And you know, if, we, if they have an analysis available, that'd be helpful. If not, we can make some assumptions based on ingredients or what's on the tag. But unfortunately, energy is not on the tag. So that makes it a little bit more challenging when it comes to balancing a ration on a commercial feed. Convenience feed, so these are uh, ways that we can deliver nutrients in a, in a, a way that saves us some time. Um, and if you think about a convenience store, the, the items in a convenience store are more expensive than a grocery store. So if I'm you know, going on a road trip and I go to Kroger and buy a case of water, those 24 waters are probably gonna cost me five bucks, right? If I forget to buy my case of water and I have to stop and get water at the gas station, then that bottle of water at the gas station is probably $2 or more. And that adds up. And that's a whole lot more than buying a case. But it, the time it saved me to just run in the gas station and grab a bottle of water, that was convenient for me. Uh, and so same thing with these convenience feeds. If you're feeding a tub or a tank or a hot mix, something that's um, providing some protein, and maybe even self-limiting, uh, it saves you time, but it can be costly for the price per pound of nutrient, and it can be pretty hard to monitor um, intake on these types of feeds. So just you know, understand that there's a trade-off between 
price and convenience. And you have to figure out which one of these, if any, works best in your situation. Um, I'm going to skip over that NPN. I meant to take that, that out, but I want to think about, you know, nutrient value of these feeds. So we've worked through kind of forage quality, getting it tested, how it relates to the nutrition of the cow, and now what actual feeds do we use and how do we balance them? Um, so thinking about nutritive value of feeds, it's a, a lot more expensive to get a feed tested than it is a forage. Um, so of course, you know, I've got have it tested. That's kind of an ideal, that's what we would do, but we know that that's not practical for a lot of us to do. Um, so if you know the ingredients or a, a general idea, then we can use book values to get us pretty close. And really the main thing is making sure that this feed is valuable from a nutrition standpoint and also cost effective. And if you find something that's cheap, then it's probably cheap for a reason. So um, feed is not something that we want to skimp on. We want to make sure it's quality and it's going to meet the needs that we have. Um, so if you find something that's cheap, I've got a, a picture there. It's a little bit hard to read, but it's called genuine and imitation good feed. Uh, and if you look at the ingredients, those are wood chips, clay, motor oil, and lawn fertilizer. And if we did an analysis on that, then there's a good chance we'd see a high protein based on that lawn fertilizer. Uh, and there's some fiber in there, so it would give us some kind of energy value. But that doesn't mean that it necessarily relates to what the cow needs. So if it's cheap, there's probably a reason. So just look out for that if you're, um, if you're tempted to buy a feed stuff that's pretty cheap. And I'm not sure that there is a cheap feed right now, right? Everything has, uh, has gone up. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at this on a cost per pound of nutrient. Uh, I've got an example here of corn gluten versus a liquid feed. And so we know that the dry matter percentage of these is very different. And we have to adjust based on that dry matter and adjust based on the nutrient that we're looking at. So the concentration of crude protein is different between these feeds. So what we need to do is take the, the cost per ton of total feed and calculate that down to the cost per pound of protein, if protein is what we're trying to feed. Uh, so I've got that example here. I'm not gonna go through the, the math, but um, I, I broke that down here. And we can see in this example that liquid feed is 58 cents per pound of protein and corn gluten is 52. And so there's a six cent difference there for every pound of feed that I'm feeding. And if convenience is important to me and that liquid feed works and that six cent difference is not gonna break the bank for me because it saves me time, then that might be the option I go with. If I have time to hand feed or feed you know, more often um, and I'm trying to get my, my feeding budget down kind of to the penny, then I might choose corn gluten in this situation. So you have to consider that price per pound on a nutrient basis. And then also think about what I call, you know, shipping and handling um, and logistics. So is it something you're having to haul very far? If it's high moisture and you have to haul it very far, then it's not probably not going to be economical. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar, you know, they're in Kentucky with feeding distillery byproducts. And if they have a lot of moisture, you can't afford to haul them very far before they're no longer cost effective. And then do you have a way to handle whatever that feed product is? Um, so it's more than just thinking about the price, but also the other things that go into actually delivering that feed. And then just to wrap up here, uh, hay storage matters. When we put up our hay, if we put it up and, and don't cover it and keep it out of the rain, then we, we're going to get some nutrient loss. Um, and so this is a picture that hay that was stored uncovered, um, we could see a 35% nutrient loss there. If we do go ahead and cover it, we see a less nutrient loss. And then if we cover it and put it inside, then in theory, we don't lose any nutrients. And so the better job we do with our hay storage, um, the more we're going to have at the end of the day. And then when we go to feed it out, we want to make sure it's not wasted there either. So we take the time to either put up or purchase good hay. And then if we put it out for the cows and let them, you know, be picky and, and trample some of it and lay in it, uh, then we're going to lose some there too. So using bale feeders or hay rings, um, 
limiting access in some way or, you know, finding a way that um, keeps them from from being able to waste a lot of it is going to help recoup some of that loss that we could see. So if we break down these loss numbers, if we don't do a good job with storage and handling, uh, in this example, we have a cow that needs one bale of hay per month. That bale is 900 pounds, and we don't put it up to where it's going to you know, have little to no loss. So we store it outside. It's got a 30% loss here. And then we feed it continuously, um, don't limit their access. We lose another 25%. And so now we've pretty well lost, you know, half of our hay just to waste or um, or to refusal. And so that means our hay bill is twice as much. We're going to require two times the amount um, just to provide the same nutrients. So we've got several stages that we have to think about here. We've got to think about making the hay uh, at the appropriate quality, um, you know, fixing any deficiencies that we see and then trying to reduce the loss as much as we can through storage and through feeding. So to summarize what we talked about, if we don't meet the requirements, then we're gonna sacrifice their direct performance, whatever that is, whether it's their growth, if they're stalker calves, um, their reproduction and the time that it takes them to breed back, their health and well-being, and then their overall quality of the carcass you know, down the road, even if we're not feeding that beef out on our farm, um, it's eventually going to become a beef product. And so if we don't meet the requirements at any stage, then that performance is not uh, where it needs to be. It can also affect their offspring. Um, so if we are not meeting the dam's requirements, then we can negatively impact um, her calf as well. So with that, uh, if we have time for questions, I know I went a little bit long there, but I'd be happy to, to take any questions. My contact information is here. Um, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me. And I, I know that you have a great team of beef specialists there and forage specialists too there in Kentucky. Um, I always enjoy talking with them and working with them. Um, so certainly reach out to them as well um, if you have questions. All right. That was really great, Dr. Mason. So um, if you all have any questions for Dr. Mason, go ahead and type them into the chat um, and we'll get those answered for you. Um, but maybe while folks are, are typing some questions in, I'll, um, I'll start off with one. Um, so you kind of touched on maybe why we don't want to feed a, a bunch of corn and when we're feeding these forage-based diets. Um, and I know, especially in Western Kentucky, that's something I've gotten some questions about is, as people have uh, maybe some corn on the farm that, that they're thinking about trying to feed. Do you want to talk a little bit about maybe some of the limitations or, or things that we might think about uh, when looking at using corn as an energy supplement? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and certainly we have to use, you know, sometimes what we have available to us, and especially um, if it's something that's already on farm, right? So um, the reason that I said it doesn't always fit well in a forage-based diet is if we think about the way that forage is, is made up, it's made up of fiber. Um, and then if we think about corn, that tends to be more starch. So two very different energy sources for the rumen. And if we feed a lot of forage to a cow, a lot of fiber, then their rumen acts on that fiber in a certain way. And if we transition or switch them to a starch-based diet, um, then that starch kind of shifts the way that their rumen works. It creates a little bit more uh, acid buildup, essentially. So they create more VFAs more quickly, um, volatile fatty acids. And basically what that can do is if they get a slug of, of starch in a forage-based diet, um, then it can start to affect the pH in their rumen. And if it's a, a really serious case, um, then it can impact the way that they even are able to digest forage. Um, and so whenever I recommend a, a supplement in a forage-based diet, I tend to recommend a fiber-based energy supplement. So something like a soy hull pellet or a corn gluten feed, um, those have a little bit more fiber, less starch, but they're still gonna provide a good amount of energy in the diet. Uh, so that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. All right, so we did have one question come in. Um, 
think the question's kind of asking, um, can we use protein tubs as a supplement um, in pastures where maybe we have a, a couple different species uh, of livestock, in this case, cattle and horses? Uh, sorry, together. I cut myself off there. That's okay. That's a, a, a good question. So um, protein supplementation in mixed stock, that's a you know, something we're seeing more of is people wanting to do multi-species type stuff. Um, so protein tubs, a lot of times have non-protein nitrogen in them. And that non-protein nitrogen can be used by ruminants because the microbes in their rumen can make that non-protein nitrogen become a source of protein that cows can use. Horses, however, cannot use non-protein nitrogen the same way. Um, so it, it's not going to benefit the horse to have that protein tub supplementation because they can't utilize the protein that's in it. Um, if you happen to have a feed that has an ionophore, an ionophore can be toxic to horses. Um, so I know that you mentioned protein tubs, but I just want to draw some differences there. Non-protein nitrogen can't be used by horses. It's not beneficial ionophores are toxic to horses. Um, and so depending on what you're feeding and what it's composed of, you just need to make sure that, you know, if it has something that can, can be toxic, um, that you limit access or keep those horses from being able to get into it, which means probably separating those species out. All right, let's see. Is it cheaper to buy low quality hay and use a supplement? or buy high quality hay? That's a, that's a good question. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. Any economists in the house? No. Um, so that's one of those like kind of a case by case basis. I have to know how low quality are we talking? Are we going to create a situation where, you know, we get cows with an impacted rumen because they're eating such low quality hay that it's not going anywhere. It's just kind of sitting there. Um, and so they, essentially starve, but their rumen is full of fiber. Um, it depends on the price of the supplement. It depends on, you know, kind of a lot of different factors. So uh, the classic extension answer is it depends and, and you need to take a closer look at what those feed resources are um, and what that situation is to determine which one makes more sense. But I, I think it's a great question. I think it's a great consideration, you know, figure out what you have or what's available to you. And if it makes sense to, you know, have a cheaper hay and, and add a little bit of supplement, then that could be the right choice. It, it really just depends on the price of those individual um, forages and what the quality trade-off is. Yep, I agree. That's definitely a, a probably a case-by-case -case scenario and, and probably requires putting the, the pencil to paper to, to figure out exactly what your uh, best value is going to be there. Um, so I've got one last question for you if we don't get any others that come in. Um, you talked about NIR for hay testing, and we do have a lot of, of folks that use the NIR method. Um, our Kentucky Department of Agricultural Lab uses NIR. Um, can you touch a little bit on uh, the importance of kind of knowing what your forage type or, or species is in that sample when you submit that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So those NIR calculations are, are based on calibration equations. Um, and that means essentially that they've had a lot of samples represented to build those calculations. And if they don't have a lot of samples that build that calculation, the calculation is less accurate. Um, and so what that means is if you are fescue, for example, uh, here in Kentucky and, and Tennessee, we have a lot of fescue, right? A lot of our samples are fescue, and so we have a large database, or the, the place that we get the equations from has a large database of fescue um, information. So that sample analysis is going to, you know, probably be more accurate because we have a lot of information backing it up. If we get a forage species that is different, so for example, when I did my PhD, I worked on alfalfa Bermuda grass mixtures, which were not super common at the time. And if we send that to a, a test, excuse me, a lab and don't indicate that it's actually a, you know, a Bermuda grass alfalfa sample 
and they run it on the fescue equation, then I'm going to get values that are probably not accurate because I need to test based on what that species is. And so we want to have equations that are accurate. And we want to identify our forages accurately so that they can match up the analysis with what we actually have um, and not have that discrepancy between the values. All right, so we have one other question that came in here, and I apologize if you've got some background noise coming from, from my end, but um, it seems like we have a lot of mud in Kentucky, as I'm sure you all have in Tennessee as well. Would you recommend using protein or tubs that have more fat in them um, because of the energy that the cattle are, are using to get through the mud? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So um, something that we don't always think about, we know that mud's out there, right? We have to get out in it and it's kind of a pain, but um, every inch of mud or additional inch of mud that, that cow has to work through adds to her energy requirements. So she has her energy requirements that are just there from you know existing. Potentially cold weather increases that energy depending on how cold it is. And then having to walk through mud to get to feed um, is going to compound that even further. So fat is going to be a really energy dense um, ingredient and a way to get some of that energy into the cow. So having those tubs as a kind of an insurance you know, policy to help provide that boost of energy can be helpful. Um, and, and like I said, it's a question of if I'm putting protein tubs out here or tubs out here that have you know a lot of fat and I'm spending a lot of money and not seeing them be helpful if my cows are still in low condition or, or whatever, then I need to probably evaluate if that is an economical choice. Um, but I do think that they're a good way to deliver something that's energy dense, especially in those scenarios where we have um, kind of a muddy hay feeding area. So just, you know, making sure that it's economical for you or that it's at least a, a good return on that investment that you're putting out there by translating into the cow performance that you're hoping to see. All right. Um, well, that's all we have for, um, but I want to thank Dr. Mason for joining us tonight um, and, and covering a really important topic for us uh, as we move into these winter months and, and trying to figure out how to feed these cows with the, the high prices that, that we're all experiencing. So thank you, Dr. Mason, for, for joining us tonight. Great. Thanks for having me.